once again, this has been super awesome to bring Collab here. Um, and really, one of the things we try and do every time is it, we run Collab is to talk to people in the local coffee community just to get their insights and to really understand what's going on here better. Um, these conversations also, they're generally very friendly, so hopefully they will be today. Um, and they're a great opportunity for you guys to ask some questions to different you know, roasters, people, business owners around the coffee business here. So I will briefly introduce everyone and then they can really introduce themselves. I think that's the fair way. So this is Brigine from Established, and Mark's right there as well. So they own and run Established. Um, if you haven't been there to have coffee, you should check it out before you leave. <laughs> this is Ben from Root & Branch, who've been one of the coffee sponsors, which is awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, the, you have a shop and a roastery kind of shop here in Belfast. We have Ross from Bailey's. The, once again, another great coffee sponsor. Um, and finally, we have Ryan from Lost and Found, which is a great cafe up in Coleraine. Um, I've had the pleasure to visit and run events there in the past. I don't know Ryan before I know the owners, or it's a few different people involved in the business, so it's really cool to hear what's changed there and, and what's going on. Um, but like I said, maybe you guys might want to introduce yourselves in more detail. So let's do it in... Reverse. We'll start with you, Ryan. Yeah, so I, Ryan from Lost and Found, I uh, am the head barista and assistant manager there. I've been there for just over two years of the kind of three and a half years that Lost and Found have been a cafe. Um, for those of you who don't know who, where Corian is, it's on the north coast. It's a little bit of a destination spot. Um, everyone flocks there in the summer and Easter and then kind of quiets off a little bit in the winter. But it's a beautiful spot. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so my name is Ross Kane. Um, I manage the, the wholesale uh, side of the business with Bailey's Coffee Roasters. Uh, we're a Belfast-based uh, roastery. Um, we've been going just over, uh, well, just over 20 years. Um, I'm uh, with the company just realizing nearly nine years um, in January. So, um, uh, yeah, we've been developing quite a lot over the over the, the time that I've been with the company. Obviously, seen a lot of quite a lot of change uh, in the in the in the global specialty coffee market, and, and especially uh, in Belfast, uh, more so over the last the last few years. So, um, yeah, we've just been developing and trying to get better uh, and find new and better ways to do things year on year. So, uh, we've kind of uh, moved premises a few years ago, um, added to a roastery, um, brought in you know a, a Q grader and, and a lab, and we're sort of we're just constantly trying to get better and improve uh, and unlike a lot of I suppose uh, uh, of the other uh, wholesale roasters uh, that started with a retail shop we've always been wholesale so we've never really had a had an outlet we've always been supporting uh, uh, especially coffee customers and uh, uh, yeah that's uh, that's been my role with the company so that was my first uh, foray into coffee uh, I was with Bailey's and that's I've been there the whole time so uh, that's kind of uh, where, where, where my experience is from. Uh, hi everybody. Hello. Okay, so uh, my name's Ben. Um, I'm from Root and Branch Coffee. Um, we started as a pop-up in 2011-2012, and we opened up our little coffee shop roastery up on the Ormer Road. It's tiny. Um, you probably couldn't swing a handbag very far in it at all, um, but we managed to squeeze in a roaster and a coffee bar, and we opened there in May 2016. And we've just been having adventures with roasting coffee and meeting lovely people in the specialty coffee community and being really excited about what's happening in Belfast and around Ireland um, around specialty coffee. Um, obviously, we've been very inspired by a lot of people that have really kind of uh, begun that journey here. Um, and so it's really exciting to, to kind of so in some way be part of that. Um, we opened a second little shop uh, in June. Uh, which is more of a coffee bar. Um, we just basically focus on coffee. Um, we have little pairings to go with that, but mostly we just brew coffee and have fun with that. Um, we supply a number of places also. Um, and yeah, it's just a lot of fun to be involved in coffee. It's a great, great industry. Uh, I'm Bridgine. We, myself and Mark, own Established Coffee just across the road. Um, 
I feel really nervous every time I do this. It's horrible. Um, uh, we will be open four years uh, next week, actually, um, which is very exciting. Still can't believe we're opened. Uh, we just wanted to open something in Belfast that served great coffee, um, great service, and then we've built the food with it. Um, but that has taken a while. Um, so that's basically our little story. Cool. I think one of the things that is always interesting about these discussions is kind of the progression where people see their local scene going. So how, wh how long ago did Root & Branch open? A year and a half, two years? May 2016. So you're here from the youngest business actually, right? Okay, cool. Um, so, I mean, the, and how long have you been with Bailey's Ross? Well, I'm with Bailey's coming on nine years now, uh, myself, and the company started originally around sort of the mid-90s, um, and then roasting coffee uh, probably just over 15 years now. So, so obviously like a range of like different perspectives on this, and so I'd love to hear kind of where you maybe see coffee going or what you've taken from how it's changing in the last few years and, and what you've seen that's that's maybe going on here. I don't know if anyone particularly wants to start. Uh, when, when we, uh, we both had a coffee, or background in coffee through Starbucks um, and uh, 2004 was the first time they'd actually came to Ireland. Um, and what we kind of loved about them, and I think we all kind of had a romance of Starbucks to start with, um, their systems are superb. Uh, so for us, it was more if you can take the noise out of what someone has to do every day on a daily basis in a shop and give systems for that, then you should be able to concentrate on the service. Um, and that's what we kind of hope to do. Um, but at the very beginning, you're obviously very do I, you don't really, like you're just jumping into something, especially when you have uh, borrowed money to do it. You're just on a kind of, I suppose, a journey of adrenaline the whole time. You're just like, just go and do. So when we opened, we just kind of went to somewhere that was a lovely space to come into. We use 3FE, they're based in Dublin. We've always, we've been with them from day one. And um, we then have kind of built, I suppose, a little bit, going from two, three, four people, and with now 19 people in the shop. Uh, so you can see that from, I just going from when we opened, uh, there wasn't really anything like it four years ago in, in Belfast. And what's amazing is over the last four years, it's watching so many cafes open. And what's unique, I think, about the mall is that everyone's doing their own thing. Uh, so you go to somewhere like uh, Cafe O, you go to Bowdoin Park, you can go to General Merchants, uh, go to Root Branch. Uh, you know, different people are kind of doing their own thing. And I think there's something in the city even if you're not sure about specialty coffee, and it can make people feel a bit uncomfortable when you kind of go, hipsters, and you know, it's like, if you love the hipsters, let them be hipsters, like, there's nothing wrong with hipster. But it, you, I think allowing people to go into having different in the city centre, there's something for everyone. Established is not going to appeal to every single person, and that is totally okay. You can't make someone like something if they don't want to, but you can definitely direct them into somewhere that you feel that they are going to like. And I think that's what's quite unique about Belfast as a city. For so long, no one came here. There wasn't really businesses because of obviously there was a conflict here for such a long time. And I think that people are very, um, people have been very generous to us and have allowed us the time and the space to kind of build the trust that they now have with us uh, within established. But I think actually seeing so many different places opening and doing their own thing um, allows the coffee community in Belfast and on the outskirts to kind of, you know, shine and do something different. Uh, yeah, I totally echo that. Um, I think Belfast um, and Northern Ireland is kind of a city and an area in renaissance. Um, I think that there is a kind of coming out of the woodwork uh, of opportunity and creativity. And I think that one of the industries that is kind of showcasing some of that is specialty coffee and food. Um, and there's some really exciting stuff happening with that. And I think it's for a whole range of different reasons. Um, one of which is, you know, coming through some of the legacy of the Troubles um, and wanting to kind of 
breathe us, uh, you know, some fresh air and uh, find some hope and some excitement and some normalcy and bring in some of the things from other places that people have traveled to and been inspired by. I know certainly that's some of my journey. Um, but I also think that people like Mark and Virginia opening established um, kind of um, sort of open people's eyes up to, you know, like doing things um, with like an unrelenting um, desire for quality um, and a real authenticity of identity with that. Um, and that, yeah, maybe some people won't like that, but also maybe some people will like that. And if we're clear about that and we believe in it and we're passionate about it and we make it a welcoming environment and we push to be better and we systemize it as much as we can to create that noise, you know, like dampening of that noise to allow that focus on the passion and the creativity to shine through, then I think that it creates something really special. And I think there's lots of diverse examples of that kind of thing going on where people have a slightly different take on things where they have incredible food offerings that maybe take more of the center stage and coffee comes along with that, or maybe it's all about the coffee or maybe it's a combination of both. Um, or maybe there's a, a whole other angle like it's got board games involved at Venice Belfast. So there's a lot going on with that. And I think that um, the clientele that we encounter daily is becoming much more educated and discerning. I think we have quite a small population and information spreads quickly. And people are kind of used to um, a, a lovely aesthetic these days. Um, we're quite an Instagram friendly nation and I think that visually people have put a lot of effort into curating beautiful spaces and really trying to make that happen um, and make it accessible for people. And I think also in the city you can't take yourself too seriously um, or you'll be knocked down a peg or two. <laughs> so I think that that sense of um, welcome and you know not being too cool for school is something that could never really happen here. Um, so I think that it, there's a whole load of things that are really exciting and kind of unique about what's going on here. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. Cool. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely uh, agree with, uh, you know, the, the, the background, the context there that uh, Bridgine and, and uh, Ben have both, both mentioned. There's certainly like, you know, the uniqueness of Belfast, obviously, that you mentioned with kind of being shackled by our, our, our more recent sort of history. And uh, we've, only, we've kind of been, I suppose, while other uh, places were, were developing kind of more in terms of food culture, um, we've always been a bit kind of slower to, to get to, to get grounded and get, get developing with that sort of stuff. So um, it has been, I mean, even I think my journey with, in coffee and my journey with Bailey's, um, you know, uh, about nine years ago, when I came on board, not knowing very much about coffee, I think uh, like Stephen Morrissey had just won the Irishman, had just won the, the World Barista Championships. This is quite a big thing, um, and I think we we'd supplied Carl Purdy, who had been the the Irish Barista Champion just before that, and that was kind of a, he had started to then develop and, and push a, a sort of a the third wave, if you like, in in Dublin, and that started to get momentum, and then and then Colin came through under him, and then set up three FE, and, and they got that momentum there, um, and whereas we had. I suppose, uh, as a company, we had always been focusing on on specialty and, and bringing in specialty coffee. Um, there was always that reticence to really commit. I think um, uh, for a shop to, to commit to, we're going to just be third wave. We're going to we're going to focus entirely on this. And uh, I mean. <laughs> He's being reminded today. I forgot about this, but even before Mark and Bridging set up established, remember Mark? I remember setting up Coffee Calendar, which was uh, just a group um, to, to, to run a few events, just to kind of gauge an interest in the specialty coffee community, and, and it kind of it rotated between different shops. And you know, we had a ladder, ladder art competition one week, and there was a you know a, a, a cupping competition the next month or whatever. And it just kind of was to try and I suppose gauge kind of an interest and, and start to build a bit of a community and I think kind of even now like you know we team up with the guys on, on sort of like the Aeropress competition once a year and I suppose it's a good sign you need, need a slightly bigger venue each year the, 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 the community's growing but it's still kind of in in, in its infancy Um I guess it was it, yeah I, I give credit in terms of like Mark and Bridging setting that stall out and kind of committing to, to the values of, 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 um, of third wave and um, 
and kind of not compromising on that. Um, prior to that, there was, I mean, uh, a couple of guys had tried. I, mean, I remember there was a, a, another shop owner had tried to set up a brew bar and took, took a sort of a six month lease to see if it would work. And whether it was the time or the location or just that, that, that the, 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 a variety of dynamics, um, you know, that, that didn't happen. And it's kind of, it takes more and more um, of guys like this to kind of, to start to increase that coffee community. and. Um, I suppose you know, in my time in, in the in the industry, I suppose that one of the big changes when I mentioned, like you know, James Hoffman and Stephen Marcy, at at that time was the, the really the emergence. There was no real barista culture at that stage, and I think you know that's become more and more dominant, where the baristas are now really driving decisions and uh, kind of um, you know uh, really generating that interest. Um, and we just I think need to. Um, We'd love to see kind of this community growing, uh, more specialty shops and getting more people over to inter interested in specialty and uh, more people wanting to, to, to move to a, a career uh, as a barista or see, see the future in specialty coffee to, to drive that as well. So, sorry, I'm rambling a bit. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So, yeah, I mean, what's your perspective on things? How long have you been working in coffee now, right? So, I also started my journey out in Starbucks in 2012, which obviously looks very different from, from the specialty market. And um, I can remember whenever Lost and Found was starting as a pop-up in Dave, who's the, the owner of the shop, just in his, in his kitchen, and thinking that I'd never seen anything like that on the North Coast because, uh, fortunately because we are a destination town during, during the summer, we have everyone with sort of bright eyes come down from the city with having experienced sort of all the all the new things on the scene, and then whenever winter comes, we're kind of left with with a with a population who is mostly kind of retirees and some some students. And it, the Korean wasn't in in my head somewhere that would have been uh, poor thinking in terms of culinary or coffee uh, in the coffee scene. Um, Fast forward a couple of years, and uh, I was lucky enough to join join with the guys in Lost and Found, and it's been amazing to see, even in the space of two and a half years, how that coffee culture has has changed so much. Um, I remember first walking into Lost and Found, and their the first day of opening the cafe and reading on their menu that they had a, a little message up saying that the the temperature of your milk is meant to be a little bit cooler, and uh, <laughs> this wasn't a wrong thing, and I think the guys had a lot of battle with that and certainly whenever I, I joined sort of a year after they'd opened it was still a, an ongoing battle and kind of explaining that your coffee isn't wasn't better and that it was actually an acidity and this is the, there's a beauty in that and everything that was going on and why the cups were a little bit smaller and just have seen in two and a half years how uh, people are beginning to grasp and really appreciate and understand and wanting to understand uh, better coffee and taste better coffee and it's just been it's been fascinating, kind of. I think traditionally Northern Ireland has always been seen as having ver being very close-minded on those things, but actually seeing that beginning to that kind of um, expectation be broken, and uh, just it's been amazing to kind of see outside of sort of city environment in in Corey and the kind of small small Northern Irish town that the the culture is changing in around coffee. Um, yeah. Do you think generally that? now Northern Ireland is, is more ready for this? or Because one thing I, I notice is a lot of, from my experiences working here and meeting people is there's been a lot of like coffee calendar and like pop-up, everyone does a pop-up version of what they're gonna eventually do, almost. And I wonder is that, do you think that's because people are worried that it won't work? Or do you think that's just like, that just happens to, it's like a coincidence? I mean, do you? to start up <laughs> like we just had to start with nothing um, and when you have nothing you have to go with like opportunity um, and make something from nothing um, and so pop-up was kind of our only option um, like 2011 2012 established hadn't opened um, specialty coffee was kind of unheard of really um, and I had kind of been quite inspired by things that I'd seen in Seattle and San Francisco and New Zealand and um, I wanted to do something which I thought at the time was like um, kind of local or organic and ethical coffee and something something around that, better coffee. Um, and 
it was only kind of getting into that process and linking with organic farmers and linking with coffee people that I suddenly started to discover a little bit more about what that meant, you know, and what specialty coffee is and what is direct trade and what is fair trade and is it fair and what is organic and where is it important and where is it maybe not important and all these different factors and nuances that really come to fruition within speciality coffee. And, um, and so from doing pop-ups, I was able to really learn a lot of that um, and gain momentum and gain knowledge that just I wouldn't have had access to at all. Um, so that gave a lot of time to incubate um, as well, so that was a really important phase for us. Um, uh, yeah, the the coffee calendar thing. I remember the first one that we ever did was the first uh, flag protest, <laughs> and the worst snow. <laughs> it was in the black box, and we had organised this coffee calendar and. Literally, it was mental in town. They were going mad at the city hall all day. There had been riots, and we decided that we would just go ahead with it. And 70 people arrived, and we were just totally blown away with, holy moly, people will even come out, flag protests, and literally snow up your ankles. Great. So there's obviously something in this. Um, but I think uh, we had Steve uh, Leighton over uh, in the, the cafe a couple of weeks ago, and I remember him, us, like a few years ago, like we'd went to London and we tasted coffee in, in 2006 and we're lo totally blown away with actually coffee doesn't, can taste like this. It doesn't just taste like Starbucks um, and it has its place and it's okay if people like Starbucks, totally fine. But we were in Monmouth Street and bought coffee from there and we're just totally, this is delicious. Oh my good, you can taste every flavor in this coffee um, and that kind of started something you know hmm, okay maybe there's something in this but then we started ordering from has been and uh, I love the fact that he named his coffee filter I thought this was great this was hilarious PHIL and uh, who is this guy and I think that was a bit of the coffee calendar and stuff as well and then all of these people coming out in this terrible evening making their way down wanting to talk about coffee um, and uh, and we kind of thought, yeah, there must be something in this. But I think building something, opening something like established is a little bit organic. You kind of do go in, just open the doors and go, just get some coffee and get some money in the till, and then we'll see if we can pay everyone tomorrow once we've closed, and then we can open again. Um, so I, I kind of think we didn't do, we just jumped straight in once we'd kind of done those few things and thought, actually, this is something we would really love to do, and I think we'd be really good at it um, because we like being with people, and then we can add great coffee to it, and then we can kind of add food if people want. So that was kind of, I think there is a place for pop-ups, especially if you don't have any money, you know, it just, that's... It's a good place to be, and for people to allow you to do that as well. Um, one thing that's kind of been touched upon, and this is not meant as like a, it's quite a sensitive issue in some, for some people possibly, but obviously you've referenced visiting London. There's obviously talk about like 3FE and Dublin and things like that. And so do you individually or as a panel feel that the coffee community here is more in touch with what's going on in the Republic or what's going on in the wider UK or kind of both? Like, I mean, there's always going to be, you know, cafes in London that are inspired by someone in Scandinavia or, or something like that. But, but when you automatically think of other coffee businesses you relate to, is it in the South or...? happily answer and say I, I would say it is uh, because I mean we would tend to be well we're members of SCA and, and you know we're part of the Irish chapter and um, we're 90 minutes away from Dublin it's our nearest neighbor it's a lot bigger bigger population and uh, we, we would know the guys and um, obviously and be in Dublin and uh, they would be up here quite a lot and you know the community is very small but um, yeah that would be obviously certainly as, as a business ourselves um, you know we, we have grown um, as well um, largely thanks to to a, a few customers, um, you know, uh, being successful in the Dublin market and developing the specialty scene. Um, I'd, I'd mentioned Coffee Angel, who you know uh, started with a with a with a kiosk. Uh, uh, you know, it's just again focusing on, on quality and consistency and. 
as a result of really the, I guess, you know, the, the recession in, in Dublin, um, the opportunity to get um, shops and, and, and at favourable rent um, allowed them to then expand and be able to, to, to provide that on a, on a wider scale. So, like, as a result of that, I guess, as a roaster, you know, and our links uh, to, to the Dublin base and that has grown from there. Um, that's not to say we don't have, uh, you know, uh, good links with with with, uh, with with England, Scotland, and Wales as well. But I think I think naturally, just yeah, the, the relationship tends to be um, across Ireland, and you can even see by the by the attendance today and at any events that uh, you know it tends to be um, uh, people within the coffee community uh, across Ireland, and and that's our yeah, I guess that's our base. I think what's quite another thing is as well is that. Um, People are very, they work quite well together and I, I kind of think that's what's kind of nice about a lot of the cafes especially. I can only talk for cafes, I don't, it's a bit more difficult and tricky for roasters because at the end of the day, these are a different type of business to a cafe, so you, you can speak for that. But for us as cafes, like we, we can work quite easily with another cafe um, because it is for the betterment of all of the community and it's such a, it's such a new career for anyone you know but and I think that's for us is just we've tried trying to build a platform that it's just not just being a barista is is good enough if that's what you want to do and trying to help people build that within the business um, I think it's definitely been a little bit easier to stay in contact with people on the island just because we're it's easier to get to however we've had lots of guest roasters from you know uh, workshop when you were there as well, Stuart. Um, we've had further field heart and uh, sweet bloom and lots of places in the States and stuff. And that's probably just more for us as tasting, wanting to taste more and more and more. But I think it's, it's there's a unique relationship probably with down south because it's easy to get to, you know, and obviously our main roaster is in Dublin. So we've got to know a lot of people and it's a very, very small community. And it's really important that everyone works together as much as they possibly can because the competition is healthy and it's good for all of us. And it can only create a stronger, better community of people. Um, uh, and that's, I think that's what we want anyway, is to work like that. Um, I, I think there's a load of influence uh, around. I think um, if you look at what uh, aesthetic people have, if you look at what food pairings they have, if you look at um, which roasters they're featuring on their bars, either as house roaster or guest roaster, it's really diverse. Um, and yeah, there's lots from Ireland, but there's also lots from the UK, lots from Scandinavia, lots from Berlin, um, lots from the States, um, and also quite a Melbourne-inspired kind of food uh, side of things as well, as well as the Scandinavian side quite a lot. I think there's multitudes of smashed avocados <laughs> um, littering about the place. Um, but I also think, you know, there is, um, there's definitely, um, a little bit of the Irish welcome, and I think there's a bit of affinity there, um, definitely. Um, but I mean, we're all back and forth, you know, all the time. And certainly, Simon and I um, did quite a lot of research trips. We went over and visited you in workshop, the guys in Clemson and Sons. Um, we went to Amsterdam. We went to Lot 61. We went to Coffee Collective in Copenhagen, um, Stump Town in the States. Um, bows and arrows in <laughs> Victoria, lots and lots and lots of places. Um, and I think lots of people are around travel and they bring that influence back. Um, and I think you see that represented in a lot of the cafes. I know Orla, who's not here, um, was massively influenced by coffee in Copenhagen. Um, so I think it's really quite diverse. And you guys would serve Kopi quite a lot up in Lost and Found, wouldn't you? Please. No, I, yeah. I definitely think, um, and I kind of agree with yourself in saying that we, I know like Lost and Found was definitely inspired by a lot of places uh, in kind of Scandinavia, as well as in uh, sort of stateside Canada, um, as well as places in, in the UK, I mean the Fumley um, down south as well. So a whole whole range of areas all kind of being brought together. Um, I think really helped inspire, inspire us, definitely working a lot with Scandinavian roasters. Um, I know we just love their kind of uh, taste profile as well as, I mean, Workshop is our, our main roaster at the moment, um, um, along with Bailey's. Um, I think we just have a great relationship. Um, the, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, yeah, I think it's 
great just to draw inspiration from all the different places because everywhere has something different to offer. I think that's what's great about all the different regions that there is something very different about all of them and being able to combine those and add your own kind of Irish twist and sort of madness to them is, yeah. Just, uh, just I suppose the final point there, uh, it's a very good point around diversity, around the, the influences of coffee and where the coffee's coming from, I guess. What, what's, I suppose, unique or, 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 or different in terms of uh, the North-South thing is just that, um, is that idea of sort of Irish hospitality or Northern Irish hospitality and ultimately the people. And, you know, um, the hospitality and the customer service um, is probably what makes, you know, um, a lot of businesses uh, across Ireland kind of unique or slightly different. Um, and just that, that warmth and kind of that focus on, on, on customer service um, is, is probably maybe why, yeah, we would, I suppose, tend to have that, that sort of affinity as well, as I said, you know, uh, that kind of, um, that, Irish, uh, that Irish hospitality affinity. Cool. I think we should offer up questions to the audience, if anyone has any questions for the panel or for anyone particularly. Nothing. Come on. No? That's fine. We can keep talking amongst ourselves. I have a question. <laughs> So I suppose my question is about, and I've been talking today about it as well, uh, attention. What do you do to retain staff, whether you're a roaster or a cafe? How do you go about keeping people in the roles that they're doing and keeping them interested? So in other words, you owning the business and doing it, but what do you do there? What efforts do you make to keep your staff? If I could, I'd love to hear from Ross first as like, someone who's yeah. worked in a roastery for nine years yeah no and and yeah so uh, good retention there uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but but, but you um, know it, there's a different perspective on this because we've been talking a lot about cafes so um well i suppose like at the end of the day you know um whether it's consumers or staff you know a lot, that, that look at a cliche people people buy into why you're doing what you're doing and um I think as a roastery, you know, we're very clear in terms of, you know, our, our values um, and kind of what we're trying to achieve and, and you know, the, the vision to, to kind of, you know, just, just keep keep getting better um, and, and provide kind of world-class coffee experiences, you know, um, with respect to, to the value chain and uh, and uh, the whole journey of the, the product from, um, from origin um, and all, all the way through the amount of people involved um, and whether, you know, I, I, I guess you know, just uh, people buy into that and get really excited. And you know, there's probably there's loads of great examples within our business, within within other businesses. But you know, I think of like you know our, our head roaster now, Stephen, who can't be here because he's he's on honeymoon, and it's probably uh, probably the most disappointed I've ever seen somebody to go on honeymoon, knowing that he's going to miss cola. But um, he was uh, you know from a kind of a street art background, which is kind of relevant to yesterday's yesterday's uh, tour. But um, you know uh, involved in kind of you know uh, yeah, producing street art and different stuff, and just that kind of uh, really creative, creative and, and motivated personality type that had really knew nothing about coffee when he joined us, and has just really embraced it, and is kind of you know the most kind of motivated, incentivized person around around uh, you know specialty coffee, and just that I I suppose. <laughs> As well, especially coffee, the idea of learning and that every day, you know, nearly literally every day is a school day. And I'm doing this nine years and still learning things every day. And as a company, we're always learning and, and looking for ways to get better. There's always new and exciting ideas. And I guess just as an industry, it's just a really fun, um, exciting industry to be in. And uh, once people kind of get into it, they kind of get the bug. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, that's what, what drives people. And um, yeah, I, I think that's why there's such good, well, I think yeah, that's what do you define as good retention, Ross? <laughs> How long are most of your well, colleagues yeah, been I, with I, you? Obviously, we would have, uh, as a roastery, like I, I guess, you know, as a company uh, in the wholesale end of things, been much uh, far, you know, higher retention than the, than the likes of coffee shops. You know, the, the, the figure of 50% was mentioned in terms of um, turnover earlier and, 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 you know, as much as 80% in, in, in London. So um, that's a real challenge, I guess, you know. Um, we, we hear it though from from obviously from our wholesale customers. There's a real challenge to to, to retain staff, and um, <laughs> there's there's no getting away from it. And it's been touched on the talks today that um, you know pay and reward for for um, baristas is, is is a big thing, and um, but also that 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 um, element of providing a you know. A, a career path, you know, uh, th that it's a choice, that, that um, you know, it's something that is going to 
you know, have a future in it for, for baristas and that they see the value in it is, um, you know, what each coffee shop, um, is ch what, what their challenge is, is and, and to hold on to that person because, you know, the next time uh, a new shop opens, paying slightly higher, mo uh, slightly higher salary with something slightly fresher and slightly new in terms of a concept, well, you know, what's going to keep your barista or head barista from moving to work for them um, is, is, a, is, a, is a really tough challenge. And I guess, you know, you, for, the, for the coffee shops, you know, you really need a, a team that are bought into to what you're trying to achieve and feel part of that. And that's that's the consistent thing across whether it's ourselves, whether it's um, other roasters um, or coffee shops, you, you get that idea of a team. And the successful guys are the ones that manage to, to um, develop and, and, and retain uh, a really good team that you don't you don't want to leave because you know you're you're letting the other guys down. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind asking you, Ryan. Do you think it's easier or harder to hold on to staff given the fact that you're away? You're in a smaller town. You're in a more like seasonal specific place. Do you see a lot of turnover as well, or less? Do you think? Um, I think the the best thing about well, I know what I love about Lost and Found is that uh, is just the sense of ownership you have around around the cafe. I know that's definitely what's kept me there. Is that whenever you you go in, you feel like you've you've you're you're bought into a little bit of the cafe every time you go in, and you're encouraged to 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 own what you're doing, to own whatever role you're in. Um, I know we have uh, a member of staff who is really passionate about helping and volunteering with Women's Aid and. We were able to offer out our space to her if, the, if she wanted to do something with Women's Aid and she was able to organise a dinner that we were able to host upstairs um, and help fuel her, her passion through, through the business. So actually using that, that ownership to, to fuel what, what passions they have, um, I think is probably what helps us retain our staff. Um, I think it's also important to... Uh, Definitely be precious about your staff, but don't don't be over precious. Don't try to hold on to someone if if they're wanting to move on, um, because sometimes this the hospitality industry is for someone for for years. Sometimes it's not, um, and I think turnover and change is definitely inevitable. Um, Dan, one of the co-founders of Lost and Found, has moved on, um, which was very hard for us to to kind of see him go. But his passions have changed a little bit, and um, actually it was a exciting to see him move on to something that he loved to do. Um, so yeah, definitely retention is important. I know um, it's nice to kind of have someone around, but if they have a passion for something else, um, it is important to kind of let them go and feed that as well, I think. Um, do you guys have any thoughts? Or would you like a fresh question? Sure. I think uh, you know a, a lot of it's been touched on there, really. Um, but I think um, that... Um, cohesive environment and like we're a very young company so um, you know um, for a long time we had no staff <laughs> um, and we've just um, had the delight of um, starting to build a, a, a solid team together and Rachel's here today um, she's our barista manager in our new place the the Oma Baths and I think um, well, certainly, our, we'll see if it works, <laughs> but um, our, certainly our vision for that is to create opportunity and career pathways for people um, so that it doesn't really just feel like you are a cog in a machine um, that is just, you know, punching buttons and clocking in and clocking out and you're not valued. And we want the person to be valued as much as the product is valued and as much as the customer is valued. And we want to really create exciting ways for people to go deeper um, into that also. So I think we're, you know, we're in a very young stage, so we'll see where we can go with that. But certainly that shared values, that vision of where you want to go and building a, a cohesive team around that and building specialisms, um, I think is certainly something that we're really excited to explore um, and see how we make that part of a more cohesive package uh, for, for people that are working so that you know monetary reward is not the only reward uh, and not the only reason for staying in a job and um, that's really important and that's got to be progressive um, but I think there are a whole load of other things which uh, make um, an environment a great place to be. The only, the only thing I'll add is that we realized a while back and we're still 
very very young we're only four years old um that you can have we had just full-time staff because we kind of at the beginning started we want to give people full-time jobs full-time contracts you know pay people well with no health benefits it in we you know free bag coffee every week discounts and whatever. so we tried to build as much as we could in but you can't have 12 leaders and that's what we kind of the aha moment was so what do we do do we lose all these great people or do we try and find different places for them to go so we could have had a little bit of uh, money last year which would have been great but then we thought actually we'll put it into a training space which is something that we really wanted to do so we've kind of built another cafe so we could you know hold classes train staff and get better at that but we're still trying to get better and that's the difficult, you know, sometimes you can be putting platforms and pedestals and you're just like, just don't put any of us up there because <laughs> we're just people and we're still trying to work some of this stuff out. But we just, we wanted to keep the people and people have been actually, we are kind of one of those lucky businesses that we have very, sm we have big retention of staff and it's something to be, that we're very proud of. Um, but we're, again, it's been, when someone's ready to go, we want them to go, but we want them to go with a good gut and go, I took what I could out of it. I'm now ready to move on. Don't leave with a negative feeling. It just means that you've stayed too long or there's an issue or something. So we, we're always trying to kind of like, look, when you're ready to go, just we. it is a laughing thing seemingly among the staff is like one of the first questions we ask is how long have we got you for? And it, like literally you try, if you get two years out of someone in this, environment you know in that in hospitality you're doing really really good because it's hard graft in a cafe every day you know but um we try to look at it like that and le want people to leave with a positive experience and um, work you know as best as they can it's not perfect but you can't have 12 leaders so it's trying to find those people and place them and give them something else to focus on within the business build the business and build them I'm still trying to work on it cool um, you can hold on to it. Uh, do we have any other questions? We might just take one more because I know it's six o'clock already. Time flies. If not, then it seems like, well, there we go, from Ben. What's the biggest gap still in Belfast coffee? By gap, what do you mean? A space that somebody can move into. It's not being covered in. <laughs> you don't mean a physical space, right? <laughs> You're looking for a shop, man? <laughs> Our totally amazing bakery. Yeah. Do you guys agree? This is where you're like, ah, oh, no. Yeah. I know, yeah, I'm just trying to think. They tried, the merchant um, tried to launch bakery and it didn't, didn't take off. Um, Tastery and Mimi a couple of years ago and this didn't work. Um, yeah, I guess you're, I guess you're right. Like a, something that's really artisan, kind of real artisan um, bakery. Um. Sorry, I think they want the recording. Oh, cool. um, sorry, uh, no. Um, just uh, Ben said bakery made me sort of thinking. Yeah, right, right enough. Uh, I guess there, there's not um, a high-end artisan bakery. Um, as to say, the Merchant Hotel uh, launched one a couple of years ago, and um, just just didn't work for for whatever reason, um, but uh, yeah, it's a, a possible possible opportunity. Um, yeah. I, I, I still, there, there's probably so many of little things. I, th I think we're just so, so new. Um, and I think that's what's quite exciting about coffee um, here. And But yeah, I would definitely agree with, with uh, ben, like, you know, the best croissant in the world is in Melbourne. That's ridiculous. It, like, that is ridiculous. <laughs> it should oh, be. <laughs> it's just like, you know, but the person who trained there trained in Paris. So, uh, yeah, I, d I mean, there's definitely a space for, I just had to say that because you're, you're pointing there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think it's just, I still, it's such a new career for anyone um, and just like four years ago there wasn't we we didn't have any train baristas because we didn't have any here it wasn't really a thing and um, it was one of those kind of you stepped into you went to work in a cafe during university or you know during part-time job at school or something it was never seen as a career so I still think 
that's a massive trend to get people to home in on. It's okay to be a barista. We just have to drive wages. That like money is a thing. Like I, no one can live in seven pounds an hour. Like you can't. Like and most of our guys have mortgages. Half of them have kids. They want to do other things. So for us, it's trying to drive as much money as possible uh, without crippling the business. And that's where we will always try and focus back into our people, because that's they are the thing that make the business work. So I still think there's massive market for really, really great baristas as a profession. Cool. Well, thank you guys. I'm sorry if that seemed brief. It, it did seem brief, but hopefully it gave everyone a flavor of kind of what's going on here. And obviously you guys are pretty much permanently here. So I'm sure the audience can come bother you within reason. <laughs> Maybe don't get their phone number and call them on Sunday night. But um, yeah, if we could get a round of applause for our panel.